Welcome to Orbital Times Podcast, and hello to everyone, whatever part of the globe you're from or happen to reside in. My name is Kelly Joe, and here we'll provide armchair conversations gathered from interviews and research reviews to explore the seen, the unseen, and the in-between of the supernatural paranormal phenomena, with topics that circle around spirit orbs, NDEs, OBEs, UFOs, time slips, mystical moments, higher consciousness, and more. I hope that this cast will be our meeting place and judge-free zone where we can explore, learn, and grow through the telling of. This cast will be launched on a monthly basis or a bi-weekly schedule whenever I'm able to make contact with those in the know for their telling of. Speaking of those in the know and the telling of, have you had mystical moments or other supernatural paranormal experiences? Care to share on this cast? Then consider stepping into the light with your telling of or send in your monologue for me to read on this podcast. Simply email orbicaltimespodcast at gmail.com for a chance to contribute to this cast. Carlton County Jail, a metaphorical walk. In this 11th episode of Orbital Times, I give a nod to the end of October with what was to be a recounting of a walk Chloe and I took in what has said to be one of the most haunted buildings in Canada. This telling of was to circle around our visit to the jail originally known as the Carleton County Jail, better known then as the Nicholas Street Jail, and involved lights flickering, a seemingly spontaneous nosebleed, and the fast reflexes of Chloe, which then resulted in her bolting down a staircase, plus a few other tidbits. However, my daughter has been and remains under the weather, so it seems that she will be unavailable for now. Well, I hope you will stay with me all the same as I lead you on a metaphorical walk to some of the points of interest within this haunted hostel hotel. Spoiler alert! I thought I would give you a heads up in case you don't want to know if you ever get to go. That county jail, now christened St. Lo Ottawa Jail Hostel, but I kind of think of it as the Haunted Hostel Hotel. Well, anyways, I'm going to provide you with some historical information about the jail, why it was constructed, who were some of its occupants back then, and now, like for instance, the ghost on death row, cell number four, and how the jail eventually came to be a hostel hotel. So, without further ado, here's my narrative, and I'm still crossing my fingers that if all goes well, followed by a part two to include an interview. Carleton County Jail. It was called the Carleton County Jail and was better known as the Nicholas Street Jail, located on Nicholas Street, close to the Parliament Buildings and the Rideau Canal, in what is now known as Ottawa, which is the capital of Canada. Construction of the stone structure began in 1860, and doors opened in 1862. The architect was Henry Hodge Horsey from Kingston. Prior to its opening, the courthouse had used their basement area as a jail, better known as the Wretched and Poisonous Basement, from 1842 to 1862. The prison's administration building faces Nicholas Street and included the apartments that had housed the prisoner's governor. That portion of the building's architecture was inspired by 16th century Italian Renaissance. In comparison, the cell block wing, located at the back of the building, There is a stone structure that is four floors high, plus a gallows, an exercise yard, all surrounded by an 18-foot stone wall. Although the stone walls are six meters high, the fully functional gallows stands visible for all to see. Henry Hodge Horsey's design was to, quote, convey its intent of imposing punishment and deterring crime while reflecting 19th century principles of prison reform, which sought to rehabilitate prisoners while providing safe housing, end quote. Carleton County Jail, Heritage, Ottawa. The term safe housing meant each person was initially to have their own cell, albeit very small, 
without heat, ventilation, or plumbing. However, compared to the previous basement prison of the courthouse, these new digs were considered airy, perhaps due to the fact that the cell windows had no glass, only bare bars on them, which would have been unbearable in an Ottawa winter. The lack of such amenities, and then later overcrowded conditions, contributed to sickness and death, but of course that was by no means the only cause of one's demise. Apparently, during that time, it was congratulated that no prisoner was ever tortured there, in the form of whipping or any other physical type of punitive measures. Really? Well, you can be the judge and jury of that. The Occupants Men, women, and children stayed in this prison. There was a mix of hardened criminals, murderers, thieves, debtors, prostitutes, drunk and disorderly, and those who had mental health issues. If a family were in debt, they could find themselves incarcerated, or, if the father was able, he could work while his family members stayed in prison until the debt was cleared, and the children that thieved stayed until their family was able to pay to have them released. It is said that the cries of children and weeping of women can still be heard. The Underground Tunnel Let's begin this metaphorical walk of the prison by starting at the courthouse. There is an underground tunnel built to transport prisoners from the courthouse to the prison, from the prison to the courtyard. Those found guilty and sentenced to jail were blindfolded prior to being taken from the courthouse to the prison via the underground tunnel. This tunnel traveled underneath prison structures and led to a trap door of the prison's basement floor. From there, prisoners were intentionally taken past the solitary confinement area and from there sent to either their cell or to be processed in the mugshot area. According to Mysteries of Canada's website, the tunnel was also used to transfer the bodies which were left in the prison's designated quarantine room to die. Those bodies were wrapped in sheets and then taken en route to be buried in the mass graves on prison property or cremated. I'm not sure where they did that deed. Claims have been made that when all is, I guess, hushed, Audible sounds, believed to be from those spirits, now plague that tunnel with their cries. The Basement Ah, oh, the basements. The basement of the prison was also utilized for at least two other nefarious deeds. It was the area used for solitary confinement, plus for holding those in quarantine. Oddly enough, the kitchen was next to the quarantine section. I guess the smell of more than just the food, or the food itself, could make one sick. The basement, also known as the hole, was used for confinement. Prisoners were sent to confinement in order to, what would they have called it, to be reformed. The inmate was stripped naked, chained, face down, spread eagle, on the stone-cold floor and left in the dark for almost 24 hours with only a 15-minute break per day, for an average of six months. New immigrants and inmates suspected of being infected with one disease or another were also put into quarantine in the prison's basement. Those in quarantine rarely saw the light of day ever again. The Chapel The ceiling of the designated chapel was designed with enclaves, which carried sound along to all the corners of that space, allowing for the clergy's sermon to be heard. As time moved forward, perhaps the space was commandeered for both guard and clergy to have their pronouncements heard while being able to maintain their distance from the prisoners. In recent history, Overnight guests of the prison hostel were or are provided a free breakfast in the chapel area, which consists of more grub than what was allotted to the prisoners. 
Some guests of the hostel claim that they have heard the weeping of women and children in that area. Let us now make our way through to the stairwell. stairwells. Paranormal activity reportedly occurs in at least one of the building's stairways, known as the secret staircase. The reported paranormal activity may be occurring due to the murders and suicides that occurred by way of prisoners chucking themselves or someone else off the stairs in between the stairwell's guardrails. I muse that the etymology of the word guardrails surely came from such actions as the one that occurred in 1910, when a posse of prisoners chucked a guard over the stairwell's railings, sending him to his death. It was afterwards that the cage gates were installed on each level of the stairwell in order to prevent further such incidents. The paranormal activity that is said to occur in the stairwell may be due to the types of deaths that occurred there. Legend has it that one of the spirits is a vampire ghost. Yes, you heard right, vampire ghost. The legend may have manifested due to an inscription that was noted after renovations began. If you're interested in what the inscription states, you can take a peek at my website, www.orbicaltimes.com. Plus, you can view some of the prison's images there. Prison Floors The ninth floor was once home to the prison's hospital, which had to be converted to a woman's only floor. With all different types of incarcerated peoples and the overcrowded and inhumane conditions, Let's take a moment to thank what seemed to be a progressive act. Not sure where the hospital was relocated, but hopefully it was reestablished on the site. Guests that stayed on that floor report hearing women and children crying. So perhaps the women here were those with the children who were incarcerated due to family debt. The eighth floor was home to death row. The prison had a total of three hangings. It's said that one of the three may have been the last public hanging in Canada, and that event just so happened to draw 5,000 people due to the infamous nature of the case. The person at the end of that rope was to be Patrick Whalen, who had been charged and convicted of the murder of Darcy McGee. I'll circle back to the paranormal activity that had been reported on this eighth floor, but first, a bit more background to set the stage as to why some of this activity may be occurring. McGee was born on April the 13th, 1825, in Ireland. In his youth, he wrote about Irish emancipation and aligned himself with those that had wanted independence for Ireland, a group known as Finian. When things went amok, in other words, a plot gone sideways, he left Ireland for Boston, but as his political views started to shift, he then headed for and landed in Montreal in 1857, and soon after that, he was elected to the Canadian legislature and became one of the founding fathers of Confederation. On Tuesday, April the 7th, 1868, after a late 2 a.m. session in the House of Commons, Mr. McGee walked the two blocks back to his residence and stopped in front of his door to retrieve his keys. It was then that he was shot in the back of the head by an assassin using a thirty-two caliber pistol. Patrick James Whalen, 1840-1868 Whalen was born in Ireland. When he was young, he too, like Mr. McGee, was in favor of Irish nationalism and, similar to McGee, denounced the Fenian group. Whalen was a tailor by trade, but on April 1868, within 24 hours of the shooting of Mr. Darcy McGee, he was arrested and charged with carrying out a Fenian conspiracy to murder. During his trial, he claimed to be a loyal British subject. 
and stated that he never shot McGee. He was convicted, although evidence was a little sketchy, in April 1869. He was found guilty of the assassination of Mr. Darcy McGee, and he was sentenced to be hung at the Carleton County Jail. Whalen was incarcerated on the eighth floor on death row for ten months in cell number four of that jail. The Day of At 5 a.m. on the 11th of February, 1869, Whalen was aroused. No, not in that way. He attended Mass, which was held in the chapel, and afterwards he had breakfast, although I can't imagine that he had much of an appetite. He was then taken down the hall, past the cells, hands tied behind his back, moving towards the door that led towards the gallows. Meanwhile, outside the prison gates, despite a snowstorm, a rowdy gathering had started to form outside the prison walls, which swelled to the size of a large town. Between 5,000 and 8,000 people had started to gather, and included, according to the Ottawa newspaper called The Globe, respectable women, young boys and girls. But hey, winters can be long and brutal, and one must keep up with current happenings. What else is there to do on a Thursday? But such were the times in Ottawa. Around 11 a.m., Whelan appeared on the gallows balcony, along with the sheriff, and not one, but three priests. Beads of sweat were visible on his forehead, for obvious reasons. Or not, for he had also just consumed prison food. Patrick James Whelan moved towards the railing to address the crowd. Some of the last reported words he uttered were, I forgive all those that wronged me. I forgive all those I have wronged. God save Ireland. God save my soul. Then he stepped back over the drop, and just prior to a white bag being placed over his head, he said, I am innocent. The rope was then adjusted. The trap door opened. He fell and he swung to his death, although not so fast. It took many minutes for him to die. Was this delay of death planned? Or just a case of a hangman with a bad hangover? I don't know. Either way, some in the crowd clapped to see Whalen floundering before he expired, which reportedly took seven minutes. Let's take a break here while we pause to consider. A side note, I hope to keep this cast a commercial-free zone. In light of that, please consider subscribing to my YouTube channel. Simply type into your search engine, Orbital Times, and you should see both my channel's name, Spirit Orb Sightings, plus that of my webpage, orbitaltimes.com, which will also grant you access to my YouTube videos and other webpage content. If you've already subscribed, many thanks. Some say while he was in prison, he was overheard, stating that he knew who the real murderer was. And the day prior to his execution, he wrote a three-page letter to Sir John A. Macdonald, the first Prime Minister of Canada, proclaiming his innocence in hopes of an appeal. Not sure why, as the last two landed on deaf ears. Perhaps he wanted to set the record straight. Either way, he never received a response. A theory. My theory, which I've not come across and probably for good reason, and is based on, well, not much really, but it goes something like this. Perhaps the group, the Fenian group, wanted to, if you will, kill two birds with one stone, or, or a bullet, or a noose. Anyways, both the accused had similar previous ties to that Irish group, and for McGee, he carried that relationship with him over the pond to Boston and Montreal was home to a large number of Irish Catholics. Perhaps McGee and Whelan were both, in a sense, victims of a planned 
Fenian assassination due to their apparent turncoat approach against the Fenian ideologies. Even if Whelan knew who actually killed McGee, it's unlikely, and it wasn't, didn't happen, that he would have fared any better if he were to have pointed a proverbial finger towards the Fenian group or Fenian Brotherhood. Anyways, it's just a thought. In the end, the government would have implicated someone connected to that group or to the Fenian Brotherhood in order to make an example and send a message that, in essence, culture and religious war that were brought over from one land to this land would not be tolerated. Just a little tidbit of information. Now, speaking of the gallows, I recall from my visit there that the gallows were accessed by a door which was located at the end of the eighth floor. Upon opening the door, there was a landing, um, sort of a poorly constructed balcony, at least at that time. To my right was a wall, and to the left was a railing, where I could see the gallows. However, when I looked up, I could see a wooden beam which ran across the ceiling. There were a set of stairs that led to the front of the gated gallows, and behind the gate, a noose was visible, as was the functional trap floor doors. Just beyond the noose were the closed doors that were once used for a gathered crowd's viewing pleasure. There was more than just the sanctioned hangings occurring in that space. The aforementioned beam was used by the guards to hang prisoners by tying a noose around their neck and tossing them off the side of the balcony. This next bit is in regards to torture. I've heard or read information that there may have been a torture chamber or chambers there in the prison, which have apparently been sealed with brick and are not to be unsealed until a number of years have passed. Also, there are whispers about a instructional booklet on torture. I am going to assume that that would have been for some of the guards. This booklet was said to be uncovered after the prison was decommissioned. Is there any truth in this? I don't know. If you know, let me know. Superstitious Beliefs Reports of Patrick Whelan's ghost in the now-haunted Hostel Hotel are abound. Might these sightings be the result of a non-adherence given to some of the superstitious beliefs, practices, and rituals of the day, which some believed should have been carried out after his execution? You decide. Patrick was hung on February the 11th at the 11th hour, instead of the traditional time of the 13th hour on the 13th day of the month. Patrick was buried with his noose around his neck, and superstitious belief was that the noose should have been removed and then burned, but he was buried with the noose around his neck. Patrick requested that his body be buried in Montreal, but his body was never sent to Montreal, and it's believed that he may be one of the three bodies found in an unmarked grave or amongst the bodies that were recently unearthed on hostile property in a mass grave. Patrick Whelan's Ghost Legend has it that the spirit of Patrick James Whelan sometimes appears to guests at night, walking straight through their cells with a Bible in his hand, or that he visits in the cells and sits at the edge of the bed. Some see him writing, perhaps in cell number four, and maybe the letter he's writing is to MacDonald. It is said that the eighth floor is always cold, even though there is heating. True, it was cold when I was there, but I just put that down to weather conditions and being in an old stone structure. Sir John A. Macdonald promised the Whelan family that Patrick would be given a Catholic burial in Montreal, as requested by Whelan. Instead, Macdonald may have had Patrick buried on prison property, laid to rest in Lyme. Ooh, well, I'll cast that bit of information over onto the superstitious pile. A final resting place. In 2002, the descendants of Patrick Whalen dug up a bit of earth from the Carleton County Jail and had it placed in Notre-Dame-des-Neiges, located north of Quebec. One of the neighbors in that cemetery is none other than Thomas Darcy McGee. A twist of fate. And a bit of irony. Shut it down. In 1930, the Royal Commission on Public Welfare 
issued a report criticizing the inadequacies at the Carleton County Jail and calling for its immediate closure. That recommendation fell on deaf ears until March 1970. That's seven zero. In 72, the city leased the prison to the Ottawa Youth Hostel Committee. In 74, Prince Philip, yes, that Prince Philip, officially presided over the opening of the Canadian Youth Hostel. And in 78, the Carleton County Jail fell under the Ottawa Heritage Act, meaning it became, and currently is, a protected building due to the building's design and historic nature. When the jail closed in 1972, it was bought and renovated by Hosteling International, which kept a good portion of the structure intact, which allowed for its guests to have an authentic overnight experience. Later in 2009, they opened a bar and called it Mugshots, and in 2011, a summertime outdoor bar was created in a former courtyard. The Ottawa Jail Hostel is no longer affiliated with Hosteling International, is reportedly to reopen in April of 2023. So, if you're up for spending a night in the tank or two in the clink, a link to this haunted hostel hotel, with its many amenities, while keeping the digs historically preserved, is available at my website, the link that is, at orbicaltimes.com. There are many hostels with the claim of being haunted, and I'm sure you know of at least one. If not, now you do. If anybody out there is interested in owning an old prison, and perhaps converting it into the same type of digs that is offered up in the Ottawa area, then check out a recent, at the time of this recording, a recent listing in Perth, Ontario, a jail for sale. The Perth jail was built in 1862, has historical protection, and like the jail in Ottawa, is connected to the courthouse, asking just under half a million. And I'm pretty sure whoever owns that will have to also have deeper pockets for the renovations that are involved. Thank you for staying with me for this walk amongst the Carleton County Prison. As initially referenced, this portion of the podcast was to be my interview with Chloe, my daughter. However, she has been ill, and I waited until the witching hour debating if whether I should do the telling of this tale without her. However, seeing how it was a family affair, us going there to the prison together, I think I'll wait for her to recover, and perhaps we'll weave our future conversation into this episode. Perhaps for February the 11th? I hope that you have enjoyed this peak into prison life at the Carleton County Prison. Oh, and if you partake, happy Halloween. Take care, everyone. Have you had a visit to a haunted hostel hotel? Or a haunted hotel, then do tell if you dare or if you care to share, then send in your encounter for me to read on this cast or step into the light and do the telling of yourself. Simply email me at orbicaltimespodcast at gmail.com. I would like to keep this cast a commercial-free zone. In light of that, please consider subscribing to my YouTube channels. All my orb videos are available by using the handle at Spirit Orb Sightings, or visit my new channel with the handle at Orbital Times Podcast. If you've already subscribed, many thanks. For blogs, episodes, show notes, bios, images, and video, please visit www.orbicaltimes.com. If you enjoyed an episode, then please give a like or a share on Anchor, Spotify, Apple, or whatever podcatcher you happen to use. If you've already done so, much appreciated. Thank you for taking your time to visit these Orbical Times. Orbical Times podcast is written, produced, edited, and hosted by me, 
Kelly Joe at Studio Spare Room.